part 13, but this is number 79 of this podcast. And uh, we're looking at the ideas of conspiracy because it seems to be, man, it seems to be a, a pretty strong tool for the enemy and creating fear, getting people to have a fractured mindset where they don't believe anything. Um, not just that they, you know, might feel like someone's not telling the truth. We all have that kind of indicator that hits us in life. We all have that little moment where we're like, yeah, I don't know if I believe that or not. But I've unfortunately we've seen some of the the bad side of this idea of conspiracy where people go so far they don't believe anything. Sometimes you can even like, I mean, I've even had people call me to be a conspire uh, like a, a government agent. That's hilarious. Actually, there's another YouTube channel that doesn't like me, so they think that I'm a government agent, um, and I, I think it's hilarious. Um, but th that's the mindset. They can't actually process the information with critical thinking on their own to determine what's good and what's bad. They just have to lump everything that they don't understand or that they they initially are suspicious of before they learn more information. They lump it all into the idea of conspiracy. Oh, it's all it must all be uh, somehow coercive and covert and you know out to get them in some way. Now, again, you know, it's the father actually talks about this mindset. So we're going to look at some of that stuff tonight and we're actually going to look at actual things in the Bible that the father says were true conspiracies, right? So let's go real quick. We're going to go to first Enoch six. Okay. And because this, the book of Enoch was removed from many of the canons um, in the United States, as well as other uh, King James based canons over the past couple hundred years, uh, because this book and other books like it, that, that validate the information in first Enoch, because they were removed, what I'm about to talk about, a lot of people don't really understand from the from the perspective that I'm going to talk about it, being that it this this was the first true by definition conspiracy in First Enoch six, um, because the idea of a conspiracy is it's going to be usually you know five or more people that have gotten together in a group that have decided they want to do something, and what they want to do is usually bad or illegal or going to hurt someone else, but a group of people usually three to five or more. Have gotten together to conspire to do something okay so this is the idea if we're going to stay true to the definitions of words which i try to do here in kingdom and context um and we're, and we're also going to try to weed out the like i've said the bad usage of this term which is what the cia gave this term i think it was in the late 60s where they wanted to now call people that disagreed with government agendas and propaganda they wanted to call those people conspiracy theorists it was a derogatory nomenclature that was given to a anyone that questioned the official narrative so and they still use it to this day in fact they've made it even more popular to this day uh, with mass censorship on digital social media video media marketplace it's horrible right they had to go youtube had to go to congress over it so they've amped and doubled down they've amped it up they've doubled down on this idea of what is conspiracy and who how are they using this this weapon of a word towards people because they do use it as a weapon and here in first enoch chapter six we actually see a true conspiracy and it's of these watchers that the book of jubilees tells us they were initially sent to the earth to help mankind which is what their job like all angels are supposed to do that that is their basic function their basic role uh hebrews 1 14 tells us that that these are ministering spirits of the lord that are sent out to those who inherit salvation so that would be perfect with why jubilee says these initial angels came and they're supposed to help mankind govern themselves but while they were here, they, they saw women lusted after them. We have the same story going on in First Enoch chapter 6, 1 through 6, where it says, And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied in those days, were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from amongst the children of men and beget children. And Semyaza, who was their leader, he said unto them, I fear you will not agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, let us all swear on oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. And then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. They were on all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. So guys, I don't know if you understand what we just read here. There's literally a geographic place in northern Israel on the border of Syria and Israel today called Mount Hermon. And it was given its name because that was one of the, the first and biggest conspiracies in all of mankind. We literally have a mountain named after the commemoration of this event. Mountain of the Oath. Not an oath between man and God, 
but an oath of rebellious angels that actually wanted to do what was against them. Now, the father goes on later in chapter 15 to express to these angels that they were not appointed wives. They were eternal. They didn't need to procreate. They were not supposed to live on the earth with wives and have families and dwell amongst mankind like that. They were supposed to go back to heaven after their mission was over. So the point is, these angels are exerting their free will, which all, all sentient beings have this idea. And they even acknowledge, Semyaz acknowledges, as he tries to coerce his fellow watchers to rebel with him, he even acknowledges it's a great sin he's about to do. And then he, he makes them take an oath to bind themselves with mutual imprecations. Now, if you go further on in the book of Enoch, chapter 69, it says that it expounds in the story a little bit to say that they actually went to try to find out the power of this oath that they sinned by so they could give a specific, they could invoke this oath in it with a specific powerful incantation of sorts with a, with a name that they had to go ask Michael, what is the actual name? And, and it tells you and it goes in at further detail, but that's really not the point. We're not digging into the, you know, the etymology of the words or, or any of that stuff or any implications, but just simply the fact that they knew what they were doing was wrong and they conspired together to do it because this is not just a situation of, and it goes on to explain later in Enoch. That's why I can't go, I can't give you a full synopsis on the book of Enoch tonight, guys. Um, many of you have heard me teach on it. Go, go watch season one of Honor Kings on Kingdom and Context. Um, but ultimately, these angels not only took took uh, wives to make families, but then they started governing men. Now, that was what they were originally sent to do, but they abused this power, and they started teaching men how to hurt themselves and destroy themselves. They started teaching them great lawlessness, as First Enoch chapter 7 explains upon and, and explains. And, and because of it, men cried out upon the earth because they were there was chaos and lawlessness. There was... They were not living according to how they were created to live, and the angels were expediting this process. They were speeding up the depravity, the wickedness, the lawlessness, um, doing it through different types of sorcery, pharmakia, and uh, the, the practices of Babylon that we've already went over in parts 10 and 11. So this was a big deal, okay? This is the introduction to this story in chapter 6, but you got to keep reading. There's a lot more these guys did as they were doing this, this uh, deed and bound themselves together in this mutual oath. Um, which was their conspiracy. They're conspiring against humanity so that humanity would kill itself. And this was the doctrines that they taught mankind. And I personally, it it doesn't say this, but I've always wondered, was, was there something greater that they had in mind, so to speak, right? Yes, they saw women, they saw they're beautiful, they wanted to take wives after them, but what does that do? But nothing more than creates the Nephilim as it explains who men they used to help rule with force because they created giants. But what's the purpose? These these created beings know heaven and earth. They know the shape of creation. They know the multiple layers of the firmament. They know where the Father is. They know the Father has a ridiculous amount of angels above that are doing what's right. And they know that he has a purpose for mankind. Otherwise, they would have been sent down there to help mankind do what was right. So these angels are helping mankind do what's wrong. In fact, they're, they're pushing mankind to do what's wrong. For what purpose? Is, is it simply because of the lust of the flesh because they wanted a wife? No, because they do a whole bunch more other stuff than just take a wife and have kids. If that was all it was, the story wouldn't be the same. As we have went about, you know, in previous uh, parts of this investing in Babylon, we've expressed how the practices of Babylon were carried forward. The same practices done by the watchers in the Nephilim through mankind and taught how mankind, this destructive behavior, that same uh, destructive behavior becomes the practices of Babylon after the flood. So Why? What's the purpose? I personally think they knew the story of the gospel. They knew the idea that the chosen priest over mankind, as Hebrews 5, chapter verses 1 through 5 tells us, a priest is chosen who's over mankind. He's chosen from among mankind. It has to be that way. So it's it's interesting that you know, that's why Yeshua had to become, you know, First Timothy 3.16, Yeshua had to be manifest in the flesh, seen you know, by angels, you know, told about the world. He had to come in the flesh so that he could be chosen from amongst mankind and validate himself to obedience, as Hebrews 5, 7 through 10 explains, to be given this honor of the priesthood, which once he got his resurrected body, which was the plan, he then has a not only this priesthood that's greater than any angelic priesthood, but also a body that's greater than any angelic priesthood because that body will never be able to sin, whereas the angels still can choose to sin if they want. And uh, apparently, once man, all of mankind's resurrected at this 
promise of the first resurrection, according to 1 Enoch chapter 5, verse 6 through 9, we will not be able to sin again. So what's interesting about this is it, I mean, this is my theory, my conjecture, but there's a lot going on with this story of this first conspiracy against man to take wives, to have children. They weren't normal children. They could have, I don't know, they possibly could have normal children. I don't think they intended to because of what we've talked about with the cutting of roots in previous uh, previous uh, installments where I expound upon pharmacia and they intentionally did that. So I, I doubt they were trying to have normal kids. I think that this, the idea of taking wives, sure, they took an attractive wife as opposed to a non-attractive wife, but that wasn't the whole motivating reason. That was more because everything else that you put into the story, all the other context, it seems they had a bigger plan and they followed through with that plan over hundreds of years leading up to the flood. Um, over a thousand years, but whether you believe in the Septuagint timeline or the Masoretic, it doesn't matter. It was over a thousand years either way that they were perpetrating this type of behavior on mankind and getting mankind to do it themselves and ruling over them by force through their through their offspring, the Nephilim, um, who were created to attack and destroy mankind. This is what Jubilees chapter 10 tells us. This is the words Noah's praying to the father. Like the, the offspring, he, he even says, you know how your watchers acted in my day. So this is where to me, it would make perfect sense if they were trying to stop the ability for the Messiah to be born through mankind. It seems to be consistent with uh, what we see in Exodus and also Matthew and Luke, right? So it's very interesting. Very interesting uh, idea of why they would conspire here. But make no mistake, it's a 100% conspiracy. It's a, it's a group of individuals getting together, intentionally trying to harm other individuals in mass so it's a it's a big deal so let's keep going here we got genesis 11 thing we already talked about it's obvious in the first two episodes of this installment so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it just as a quick highlight and reminder guys the whole world came together except for Noah and his and his uh, faithful sons which shem and his grandsons right so it's it, except for a very small few people the entire group of mankind came together a couple hundred years after the flood and determined for 43 years to build a tower that would reach to heaven. They were rebelling against the authority of Yahweh and they wanted to get to heaven. This is the, the literal high hand lifted against the throne of God that we're going to read about in a verse later um, in Exodus 17, where Yahweh actually talks about Amalek raising a hand towards the throne of God. So this is a this isn't this is done in a in another another practical way of that idiomatic phrase this entire place this entire story of babylon the origin of original babylon and the tower that was built and the city all of it was going and rejecting the authority of the father and trying to usurp his authority literally trying to reach him so they could have the, make take him off of his throne and uh install themselves as the authority which is obviously it's madness but this was the madness they collectively engaged in so it says here in Jubilees 10, 18 to 19, and in the three and 30th Jubilee, in the first year of the second week, Peleg took to himself a wife whose name was Lomna, the daughter of Sinar, and she bare him a son in the fourth year of this week, and he called his name Ru, for he said, Behold, the children of men have become evil through the wicked purpose of building for themselves a city and a tower in the land of Shinar. And by the way, guys, real quick, in, uh, in lots of forms of Hebrew, I know I said Ru, I, I don't know if that's a proper translation, or the proper uh, pronunciation of, of Ru, because um, Ra in Hebrew is evil. And uh, by the way, that's the name of the Egyptian head God who was against Yahweh and it was evil. So I think there's very fitting that they would name their kid Ru or Ra, depends on how you want to say it. And what, what language this particularly is transliterated from, it's actually from the Greek because that's where Jubilees was translated from by R.H. Charles. So therefore, it's very likely it was originally raw in the Hebrew. But the point is, he says this whole name was dedicated to this idea that the children of men have become evil through the wicked purpose of building for themselves a city and a tower in the land of Shinar. This is this is the second largest conspiracy in history, but until we get to Revelation. For they departed from the land of Ararat, eastward to Shinar. From these days, they built the city and the tower, saying, Go, let us ascend thereby into heaven. So they knew how the shape of creation looked. They knew it wasn't a ball in space. They knew there was a covering over them called the Shemayim, originally called the firmament, the Rakia. They understood what the Creator made because Noah told them where the floodwaters came from in Genesis 7:11 when they came through the windows of the firmament. 
John, he told them why there was water up there. Because on day two, the firmament separated the waters from below from the waters above. There's still water up there even to this day. So they understood the shape of creation and what the creator made. That's why they collectively were building a tower trying to get through the first level to get up to these other levels. Okay, it's like a bad version of Donkey Kong. And that, and that all pun intended because, you know, if you believe Jasher, that's part of the judgment when these guys are dispersed, some of them were turned into apes. So the point is, it is like a bad version of Donkey Kong. You know, it, it, it's like a twist. Donkey Kong, I, sh I should say, would be a twisted version of this, right? Because they're trying to ascend and Donkey Kong is throwing the barrels down. That would be like God stopping them. So anyway, not all my metaphors are, are on point, guys. Just give me some grace. But the idea is that this absolutely is this one of the biggest conspiracies, literally the world coming together. Now, guess what? As we've talked about in previous episodes, Abraham was a son of the priest of the high of the king of Babylon. So Tara, right hand man and priest of Nimrod. Abraham is the son of Tara. Abraham pulls away from this wicked behavior and learns the ways of Yahweh. So do you think that Abraham would have been persecuted by these people if he had stayed? In fact, in Julius chapter 11, he talks about how he tried to address their wicked behavior. And then he, he's praying to the Lord, I can't go back to, uh, to Chaldea. They seek my life. Yes, that he was persecuted by people conspiring against the ways of Yahweh in the ways of Babylon. And of course, the people that resist those those machinations of of purpose and deed are going to get persecuted. They're the odd men out. They're the people that are stopping progress. So, same thing with Noah. He would have been he would have been persecuted. I don't know if he was a, a, attacked. I don't know how he died. It doesn't say. Obviously, uh, the scriptures both all account that he lived another three hundred plus years after the flood. It's over nine hundred years. So that's wonderful, but we don't know how he died. We don't know what those 300 years were like. We know he was grieved because he was doing the righteous ways of Yahweh. So he, he's therefore going to be grieved with watching all his behavior happen and then picking up the ways of the Nephilim from before the flood, which is a cult behavior. Jubilees 46. We'll keep going. More conspiracy in Scripture. In Jubilees 46, 11 through 16, and it says, The king of Canaan was victorious over the king of Egypt. He closed the gates of Egypt. He devised an evil device against the children of Israel of afflicting them. And he said to the people of Egypt, Behold, the people of the children of Israel have increased and multiplied more than us, more than we. Come and let us deal wisely with them before they become too many. Let us afflict them with slavery before war come upon us and before they too fight against us. Else they will join themselves unto our enemies and get them up out of our land for their hearts and faces are toward the land of Canaan. And he set over them taskmasters to afflict them with slavery. They built strong cities for Pharaoh, Pithom, Ramses, and they built all the walls and all the fortifications which had fallen in the cities of Egypt, and they made themselves serve with rigor. And the more they dealt evilly with them, the more they increased and multiplied, and the people of Egypt abominated the children of Israel. So guys, this just isn't the new Pharaoh that took over. He convinced the people to conspire against an entire other people group. A people group who were doing what? I didn't actually have this pulled up, but if you read uh, earlier up in Jubilees 46, during the days of Joseph, all the all the brothers of Joseph and all their family that lived with Jacob, Israel, in the land of Goshen, because they all traveled down there, and then they started flourishing during the lifespan of Joseph. And it says they all dealt with each other with brotherly love and kindness, and they did the commandments. This is what, what's so beautiful about the testimony of the 12 patriarchs. Each of the sons of Joseph on their deathbed are telling all their children, all their descendants, every single one of them, my sons, you got to do the commandments of God. It's wisdom. It's righteousness. It'll save you. Here's what happened to me when I didn't do them. Here's what happened when I started doing them. Your brother Joseph's amazing. He's been doing them better than all of us. You got to do the commandments of God. You got to do the commandments of God. Every one of the sons of Israel told their children and grandchildren, do the commandments of the Lord. It is the law of the Lord, and you have to do it. It's what the angels are doing in heaven, according to the Testament of Levi. So, they were flourishing, according to the beginning of Jubilees 46, in Goshen, in peace, and in righteousness, which is the right behavior of the law of the Lord. And here comes the king of Canaan, comes in, defeats the king of Egypt, and says, all right, well, all these, uh, well, we know, he knows the history of Jacob and the Israelites. That's why he tells the, the Egyptians, hey, guys, they're not really loyal to you. 
even though they're living in your land and they've been prospering, they haven't been causing any problems, they're not really loyal to you because their face is set toward Canaan. So the moment they have the chance for an alliance, they're going to turn on you. That is paranoia bred into the people to get the people. This is conspiracy in the beginning. You have to, you have to create a crisis so that you can have the solution. We see this all the day long. We've seen this for the past year all over the world with the, the nonsense run, Rona. They have to create a problem to bring about a solution. This king of Canaan, now the new king of Egypt, creates a problem in the minds of the Egyptians so they all can conspire against the Hebrews. This is the evil form of people conspiring towards good people out of fear and paranoia that's not founded on truth. It is, the Hebrews weren't hurting anybody. They weren't doing anything. Says they were just living brotherly kindness. They were just doing their own thing until people stirred them, rounded of the hearts and the minds and the fears and the paranoias of people living around them against the Hebrews. So this is why it says at the very end, and in uh, here in verse sixteen, it says the people of Egypt abominated the children of Israel, and we see how this plays out. Exodus chapter one, uh, Jubilees forty six and forty seven. So it gets to the point where they're literally killing the babies of the Hebrews. And they're afflicting them. They're hating them. They won't even eat with them. But oh, when the when the God of the of the Israelites shows up, they want to. Some of them want to join forces and leave with them. <laughs> it's interesting, huh? So this is this is the mindset that is created within the practices of Babylon, within the cultures and the the cities, the governments of the influence of un corrupt, unrighteous rulership over people that implores the practices of Babylon creates fear it, ignorance to the point of not even looking around you just to judge your circumstances and to see that what you're being told isn't correct blind allegiance to destructive concepts and eventually death strife internal chaos lots of in chaos we see that in all types of countries where there's where it happens we've seen it in our country in the united states we're seeing it today we're seeing the fear and the paranoia being pitted against Groups of people that have to believe unscientific things versus other groups of people that are willing to research scientific ideas and scientific things and also stand on the word of God, which actually is valid, validates, uh, is, is validated by the science. Yeah, you're right, Paul. There, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go. Uh, further into the broadcast uh, don't miss the ending guys because uh, we're gonna be talking about aliens because there's a lot that's going that's going on with the machinations uh, the, the types of conspiracy that Babylon has always implored and they just figure out different ways to rebrand these deceptions and bring them on new people groups so we're gonna stick with us till the end for Samuel 13 all right, many of you might recognize this, but this is during the days of Saul and David, and we have their interactions with the Philistines. But if you see here, it says in 1 Samuel 13, 19 through 22, no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel because the Philistines had said the Hebrews must not be allowed to make swords or spears. Instead, all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen their plowshares, their mattocks, their axes, and their sickles. The charge was a pen for sharpening a plowshare or a mattock, a third of a shekel for sharpening a pitchfork or an axe, and a third of a shekel for repointing an axe, an ox goad. So on the day of battle, not a sword or a spear could be found in the hands of the troops with Saul and Jonathan. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had weapons. Oh, that sounds like a tax that you get when you try to go buy a gun. But essentially, that's the same idea, guys. They'd put a, the Philistines who are uh, ruling over, in a sense, the territory, um, uh, alongside the Amorites, the Hittites, the, and the Kenites, and the Amorites, um, and the Canaanites, excuse me, alongside those other people groups, the five lords of the Philistines bound together, each of them, and we're going to go over who the Philistines were, they, each of them bound together to enforce this weapons ban. Why? Intentionally. So they could weaken the defensive posture of the Hebrews. This, I mean, guys, this is literally the, the modern day political battle we're seeing against the Second Amendment in the United States right now. Australia's already been taken over. <laughs> they can't have guns in, in Britain or Australia. They're, 
or in Canada. Like, yeah, they can have a few hunting guns, but it's nothing that would actually protect them. They've they've literally, and it's all under the crown, of course. So it's par for the course. But um, that, I mean, it's the same. It's the same concept. How, you know, to a corrupt ruler, it's a big deal if the people that you're trying to rule over have the ability and the weapons to take you out of your place of authority. So this is why they want to limit the types of weapons you can have. And to this point. In First Timothy 13, the Philistines were even limiting how often they could sharpen their weapons. That's crazy. That is crazy. Oh, Miss Wendy, I'm not sure where you live. I don't know if you're in England or in Australia or New Zealand. I'm not sure where you are. But yeah, there's quite a few countries. I mean, you can't have weapons. China, you can't have weapons. Um, you can't have guns. That's why they've had... In, you know, there's been reports, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but there's been reports in the United States of um, mass knife attacks because they, they don't have guns to shoot with. And I know, and also in the in the UK, there's, you know, there's reports, again, whether they're true or not, we it's hard to verify, but there's reports of because they can't get an assault weapon or an automatic weapon or even a pistol, they end up having to use their car as a weapon to try to, to hurt people. So, yeah, it's rough. Oh, you're in South Africa? Okay. That's, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, it's, this is one of the, one of the huge indicators of Bab of the mindset of Babylonian control and, and the ability for them to, to go in and try to figure out systematic ways to keep the people under their control. One of them is weapons have always been like this, even back in the Bible. And who are the Philistines, right? What does this matter? You're saying, well, Sean, these are the Philistines. I mean, is this Babylon? What are you talking about? I thought this was investigating Babylon. Who are the Philistines? Well, the Philistines are the city-states in Canaan. Did you guys know that there were city-states in Canaan? Many people think, oh, I thought that was just the Greeks. You're know, like, wait a minute. Didn't, didn't we talk about in previous installments of this series that the Greeks were actually worshiping the same gods and doing the same behavior of Egypt and Babylon and Assyria and Canaan? And, oh, yeah, the Egyptians ruled over Egypt for a thousand years at one point. It's interesting what you miss, but you're not told in history class. You also have the seafaring people, the Philistines, because they lived on the plains of the coast here on the western side of, or the eastern side of the Mediterranean, they interacted with all the peoples in the Mediterranean. They were a huge seafaring nation. They rose to power through trade. And here they had the five city-states that were independently governed, but they called themselves the Philistines, it was Gaza, Ashkod, Eshkelon, Ekron, and Gath. You guys remember David and Goliath? Goliath was from Gath. So they had, they're mixed with Nephilim as well. So we know where those practices come from because you've watched previous episodes of what we talked about, where these Nephilim come from. Go see episode, uh, installment three, part three of the series, if you're interested. So huge indicator that they're worshiping Shamash and Baal, Dagon. Right, these are all the gods of the Babylonians. They just have specific regional names according to their dialect. But these five city states, with individual kings bound together in unity to oppress the Hebrews, isn't that interesting? Oh, by the way, they had alliances with the Kenites, the Amorites, the Ammonites, and the Canaanites because they're all worshiping the same gods. And they hate the God of Israel and they hate the people of Israel. So therefore they tried to root them out of the land. And then when they couldn't, they tried to incrementally take them over. This is, this is the whole book of judges. Like it's over and over and over again, you have Israelite rebels against the covenant and they start, you know, losing territory to the people in the land, a mixture of the Canaanites and the Philistines and different people to where they, they're now being subjugated by the people around them, which was exactly what you know the father had told them, Leviticus 45 and Deuteronomy 27 and 28. If you don't do the terms of the covenant, this is just, you're going to start being ruled over by your enemies. It's going to be really bad for you. So this is just one of the ways we see them doing that. And they're actually, it's a gun, it's a weapons ban, I should say, not gun, but a sword weapons ban. So here in 1 Samuel 6, 16 and, 7, 16 and 17, it says, When the five rulers of the Philistines saw this, they returned to Ekron that same day. As a guilt offering to the Lord, the Philistines sent back one gold tumor for each city, Ashkot, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. I'm just putting this up here to show you guys. These were individually ruled by different rulers. They were a confederacy. 
So there's there's <laughs> literally doesn't get more official when it comes to the definition of a conspiracy than this. Daniel chapter six, the famous Daniel chapter six. We have righteous Daniel getting falsely accused and, and manipulation of the law to imprison him. But why? Daniel chapter six, four through five. Thus, the administrators and the satraps sought a charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find chart. They could find no charge of corruption because he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was found in him. Finally, these men said, we will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. Daniel's in Babylon, guys. So he's in the heart of Babylon. He's also reaping the benefits of the covenant, just as was expressed in Leviticus 26, that if you do the covenant, even when you're in the land of your exiles, I'll show you mercy and favor amongst the rule, those who rule over you. And Daniel is maximizing that promise in Leviticus 26 in his reign between three or four different kings that changed hands. He's never killed. He's, he's <laughs> at one point, seems like he rules the entire nation for about seven years when Nebuchadnezzar goes crazy. And all the kings respect him and love him, except for these, these, uh, these three posers, right? So those three dudes, they're, they're wanting to figure out a way to entrap Daniel. And they're like, all right, man, his, his character, he's just got too much character. Like, well, guess where that comes from? Oh, it's doing the law of his God. So they're again saying, okay, well, we got to figure out a way to manipulate the law of his God against him so that we, they're wanting to slander him, literally, which will lead it to his death. So they're going to do anti tour behavior because Daniel's tour behavior was so awesome. Even in the land where they didn't, the Torah is not native, right? In the land where they're in Babylon, literally in Babylon. So these guys conspire against David to try to get him, or excuse me, Daniel, to try to get him killed. And it is, it's, I mean, it's truly, to me, it's, it's absolutely what we're seeing today in a variety of ways. I mean, people in Canada have already been, you know, for preaching that Leviticus 18 through 20 is correct, meaning, or Romans chapter one, that woman should not lie with woman, man should not lie with man, for preaching that and for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, much less the kingdom, people are getting arrested in Canada today. They, have, they do not have the same laws of free speech that you, because that's, they're basically the free speech that the Canadians wanting to have to preach the, the law of God is, hey man, this is not behavior that's good for you. That's the behavior of Babylon. Canadian government says, we like that behavior. And if you say anything against it, try to confess your law of your God against our behavior, which is the law of our God, then we're going to come after you. So we, it's also happening in the United States in a variety of ways. Um, it, I mean, there's, there's ongoing fights with the abortion issue in the United States. Uh, with a variety of ongoing ways people are trying to fight it and the enemy keeps trying to advance it's been legislated to the highest courts to say that it's okay and you can do it people people struggle against it people have gone to jail protesting against it it's crazy guys it's crazy so this is the same concept that we're seeing back in daniel's day literally as a as an advisor to the king having a issue with the other advisors who are conspiring against him so the, these are, again, they didn't even have to put paranoia in the mind of the king. They just got the king through legal legislation to sign something that then entrapped Daniel when he wanted to, to pray to Yahweh. And Daniel's not even getting to actually worship according to the biblical definition of worship. He's not getting to go and, and participate in the feast days like he wants, or he's not getting to go. And I mean, I don't know if he was doing it privately in his home, but he's definitely not outwardly and openly. There's no temple for him to go to. There's no priesthood he can go and talk to and confess his sins. I mean, he's literally just praying to the Father of he in heaven above every day. Well, thankfully, we, we're told that there's a... Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. Let me make, make sure I stay on point here. So the point is, this is a type of conspiracy that is not overt. Philistines, weapons ban, overt. All the, all the worlds come together to kill, uh, to create the Tower of Babel, to literally try to go kill God, that's overt, okay? Nephilim being made from a hybrid <laughs> uh, union of angel and womankind, that's overt. This is a subtle form that we see happening all the time in our nation and other nations around the world, but you don't always see it happening. You don't always see this conversation that we see in Daniel 6 
we don't get a camera. We don't get the fly on the wall version of seeing that like the story tells us because we now in our modern times see the effects of these conversations. We see the after effects of people that are lobbying specific laws that get passed through House and Congress later that then have all these negative effects upon the people and specifically people of faith. Just like all these coronavirus restrictions that got passed in all these states last year. And then suddenly in Louisiana, they're telling people you can't attend, you can't congregate for church. And they literally arresting people that were trying to. This started way back a year ago in May of 2020. And it's progressed. And it was for six, seven months in the United States. It was getting worse and worse. People were doing online church instead of actually congregating in person, which was a, a part of their faith, a part of their expression of how they worship God and also encouraging the scriptures. And they're still being persecuted for that in Canada, people being arrested for that. There's, According to our friends in Canada, there's people literally meeting in the woods to have church in Canada privately, leaving their cell phones in the cities and going out privately to meet in the woods. That's, that's how bad it's gotten. And why? Because of legal, unlawful ordinances that were passed based off a conspiracy which was mass control over people to get them afraid of sickness. By the way, the flu disappeared. I don't know where it went, but suddenly we've got this new thing. So all the 80 million people a year in the United States that got the flu, apparently they don't get the flu anymore. So, um, so anyway, don't, don't, don't worry about that. I'm sure the CDC is not wrong about that, but um, don't ask questions about the flu. We, sh we shouldn't ask for it. We just believe whatever they say. So the point is, it's crazy, guys. They through fear and conspiracy for the last year, they've through legal ordinance, they've gotten people to now not be able to actually follow their faith as they normally did. This is the same thing that we see happening to Daniel. It's horrible. Esther chapter nine, same concept. This one gets a little more severe. It's not just trying to kill Daniel, it's trying to kill all of the Hebrews, all of the Jewish people that are in exile. Esther, Esther chapter nine, but we're gonna kind of dig into this one a little bit because there's something here that a lot of people never talk about. This is, this is verse 24 and 25. Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast per, that is the lot, to crush and destroy them. But when it became before the king, he commanded by letter that the wicked scheme which Haman had devised against the Jews should come back upon his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Now, a lot of people don't kind of, a lot of people don't realize that there's a reason why it says at the very beginning here, Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews. It's not just like this guy alone just said, hey, I don't like these Jewish people that you have in exile all scattered throughout your 127 provinces, which is what we see earlier in Esther. He's, it's not like he just one day decided, yeah, I don't like you. I don't think you should have brought them in exile. You should have just killed them all when we invaded northern Israel. But instead, no, no, there's a reason why he's being called the enemy of all the Jews. And it's this, 1 Samuel 15. Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Interesting. Here's this. Now we have the Agag being a king of Amalek and the clan of the Amalekites, which existed in the land of Israel next to the Philistines, next to the Kenites approximately the territory of Benjamin and Simeon. So what in the world? Where'd this come from? Oh, it's there's a reason for that. It's the same back here. Exodus 17, 13 through 16. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek, his army with the sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, write this on the scroll as a reminder and recite it to Joshua, because I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner. Indeed, he said, a hand was lifted up toward the throne of the Lord. The Lord will war against Amalek from generation to generation. So this idea of that he would that Haman in Esther 9 was called an Agagite is not just by coincidence. And the fact that he's considered the enemy of the Jews, that's not by coincidence. He was a long-standing descendant that had been forced and driven out of the land by, by Saul in pieces and then by David finally. And he was from the Amalekites. The Amalekites in Exodus 17 were the first people to attack the Israelites coming out of the Exodus, picking off the stragglers and the weak ones. Enraged Yahweh. And Yahweh said, I'll be at war with them forever. 
Oh, it gets more though. Where the hell, where did Amalek Amalek come from? What's why did they even attack Israel coming out of the Exodus? The Egyptian king that ruled over them with tyranny, also from Canaan, he was destroyed. Who else is there? What's going on? Why is Amalek suddenly got beef and trying to attack the Israelites when they come out of the Exodus? In Numbers chapter 24, verse 20, Balaam, yeah, he wasn't a good prophet in the end, but he had this unique moment here in chapter 24 where he prophesied and he said some really amazing things. One of them, he says, and when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and he said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. When were there nations, guys? We've been doing this, this Investigating Babylon series. We're in part 13 now. So after 12 other parts, when were there nations? Were there nations before the flood? What does the nations mean? The word nations means Gentiles. Well, it just means the people of the nations. That's what the word Gentiles means. And you are Gentile or of the nations if you're not in Israel. What happened in, after the flood with Noah being of Israel, 100%, yes, I know Israel wasn't born yet. Jacob wasn't born yet. But he is in the, quote-unquote, nation of Israel. By the way, the word Israel was given to Jacob from heaven because that's what they call themselves in heaven. The family of covenant behavior people in heaven are called Israel. So that's why Noah, doing the covenant, faithfully and righteous as a high priest on earth, trying to teach Shem and his other sons how to do the covenant properly, they're in Israel too. Suddenly, as the Tower of Babel is being built, and then their languages get dispersed, they go off and they become nations. Amalek was the first of the nations. So we've got, in the story of Esther, guys, we've got like a bad, like a bad cyst that finally reaches the surface and needs to be popped. You got this dude, Haman, under the control of the empire of Babylon. He got swallowed up in the 127 different provinces that were taken over by Nebuchadnezzar and all the other Assyrian kings. He got swallowed up in the empire of Babylon. Just like Zedekiah, king of Israel, of southern Israel, guy, uh, the kingdom of Judah, he got swallowed up, right? He didn't live very long, but he got swallowed up. Just like a lot of kings would get swallowed up into the emperor of Babylon. And here it is. Amalek was one of the first of the nations. So their descendants and traces way back. They always hated the Hebrews. They always hated the people of the covenant. And he and he is a longstanding descendant of that and tries to, tries to enact this conspiracy so that he can kill all of the Hebrews. Just like they tried to do back in Exodus 17. So what's interesting is my wife, you know, you, you don't know if you're still watching right now, sweetie, or if you've fallen asleep, but my wife, she said that several years ago, she actually saw a documentary. And of course, YouTube's gotten increasingly bad with censorship and, and uh, not recommending videos that are related and that kind of stuff. And so she claims she saw an actual documentary of someone that had come out of an abusive family and an occult family and, and that this person was sharing their testimony. And they claimed that they were told as children that they were from the family of the Amalekites and that the God of the Bible was evil and hated them and that uh, he was not really God and that, that there were other entities that were really God and, and they weren't supposed to love the God of the Bible. They weren't there. He was their sworn enemy to their family. So this is a testimony. And, and I don't know if this was a uh, this interview was this person um, was religious based. I don't know if you're still watching, Lindsay, if you want to put that in the chat, maybe. But. All I know is that uh, it was fascinating for her to see this and then uh, for us to study the scriptures and she realized, oh my gosh, this is like, this is a modern day. This this person claims that their family told them they were Amalekites, that they were they were sworn enemies with Yahweh. Like, that's intense. Babylon is alive and well, guys. It's alive and well. It's been going on for a long time. They've just gotten really, really, really good at trying to make it seem like they don't still exist. You want to give people the illusion that they're governing themselves. Okay. So my wife is still awake and she says, no, that he, he hadn't come to Christ. Well, I, I didn't mean to um, give the impression that he 
his we came to Christ. I just mean his testimony about what he was talking about coming out of his family and not being, I, if I'm wrong, let me know. But you, I believe you told me that he, part of his testimony was that he was, didn't want to be associated with his family anymore. You're saying he was a uh, new age or kind of, so either way, apparently he had an actual sworn testimony of being his family were Amalekites. It's crazy to me. It's crazy, crazy. Oh, I'm so happy you're still awake. Yeah, she she's she said a long day, she said a long month, so um, she's been falling asleep early. So anyway, guys, this is uh this is what's so interesting about the story of Esther. A lot of people don't realize is that there there's some long standing family feuds. I mean, we're talking all the way back to Babylon. So you guys understand the story of of uh okay, one second. She's saying he was interviewed on a New Age type podcast and did leave his family, but not to become a Christian. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, his testimony still stands. That's fine. I appreciate the clarification, sweetie. Um, so we're going all the way back to Babylon. Think about what the story is in Jubilees 10 and Genesis 11 of the Tower of Babel. When the nations first were dispersed, according to their languages. You have, this is why in Genesis 10, it gives you all the, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it says these were the, the, the descendants of these kids and and they were divided up into their their lands and their their tongues, the, the what they spoke, and their nations. By the way, Genesis ten and eleven, in my opinion, should be swapped. It's I don't think they're anachronistic. I think that they're out of order. I think Genesis ten's information should be after Genesis eleven because it actually gives you the full breakdown, especially because it goes into people that were born much further after Genesis eleven. But but whatever. There's I, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't one of the scribes that compiled um, the writings of Genesis. So the point is, it's interesting that all the way back to Babylon, you have this mention of these Amalekites, and they're constantly inserting themselves in the story amongst these other clans that hate Israel and trying to kill them as well. Why? Why would you? Why would you care about these people of the covenant? What would it matter? Because if you went back to one of the first nations that was with the Tower of Babel in Babylon. Then you know, Noah didn't take part in that. Shem didn't take part in that. Abraham didn't take part in that. They were serving the Most High God. And who's responsible for destroying the efforts of Babylon? The Most High God sent his angels. Some, some people believe even he himself came down as well. Possible. But the point is, they know who they were fighting. So if, so if they just, one of their greatest conspiracies ever, the Tower of Babel, was thwarted by the Most High God. Well, they're going to go after the Most High God's children. Why? Because that's what the occult does. That's what the enemy does. And we'll keep looking into it. John chapter 11. Um, I apologize, guys. This is, a, this is I messed up. It's supposed to be John chapter 11 on the slide here. Hang on. I don't know why it says that. I don't know why it does that. Let's try this again here. John chapter 11, 53 and 54. So that from that day on day, from that day on, they plotted to kill Yeshua, Jesus. As a result, Yeshua no longer went about publicly among the Jews, but he withdrew to a town called Ephraim in an area near the wilderness. He stayed there with the disciples. Now, I'm not going over every single instance in scripture, guys, but there's there was a lot of them. Uh, obviously, we're skipping the birth of Jesus. We skipped the um, we skipped the Maccabees. I mean, we're just I'm just trying to focus on a few of them because I got some other stuff to talk about at the end. So I just, I want to give enough time, but guys, this is, this is the chief priests, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, they're all conspiring. Large group of people under the authority of Rome. They're conspiring because the, these priests were implanted by Rome. And that is actually expressed in the Hasmonean writings in the first and second century BC. These guys were plants from Rome. So this, I know many people may be saying, well, Sean, how's this fall into a conspiracy? Like, this is just the friction that Yeshua faced with the religious leaders of his day because he was disagreeing with their teachings and trying to teach them sound doctrine from the Torah. No, guys, these guys were implanted by the ruling empire that was over lots of nations. And they killed him under their authority with the go-ahead from Pilate. A lot of people say, well, but, but Pilate has a struggle with conscience. He was told that, you know, he washed his hands, but now he literally went ahead with it. It was a part of it. It was destined for one, but it was also a part of the chief, the Pharisees that were, that were, um, 
and and the priests of that day, supposedly, because they're supposedly if I haven't done a video on it yet, but this goes into other details that they weren't supposed to be the priesthood. They were implanted and chosen um, from the, the Greeks and the Romans took over. And then this is all during the Maccabees leading up to the days of Yeshua. And they ended up taking over the priesthood. And there was a big friction with the set. That was why there was friction with the Sadducees because the Sadducees, the Sadducees claimed they were of the actual descendants of the Levites. That's also hard to contest or excuse me, hard to validate. But the point is there was a lot of friction there about the ruling class of the Hebrew people which was their priesthood during the days of Yeshua. Yeshua comes along and tell them that they're all not doing the law. They're all doing it properly. They're doing their own traditions. And they're like, all right, well, since we're in, we're in the ilks of power underneath the hand of the emperor, yeah, we're just going to kill you because you're a person of the covenant. We're doing the ways of Babylon, which are the traditions of man, and we're going to kill you. And that's what they did to Yeshua, right? Thankfully, death couldn't hold him down. So, guys, this is actually why let me go here real quick. This is actually why we have this passage in Isaiah chapter 8. When the Assyrian invasion was prophesied through Isaiah and other prophets, during the days of the apostasy, approximately 6th century BC in Israel, the northern house and the southern house were both in apostasy. So the Assyrians were... The father, through his prophets, told the, the Israelites, both north and southern house, that, hey, the Assyrians are going to come in, take you over, and later the Babylonians are going to come in. So, because they were abandoning the ways of the covenant. So, therefore, it says in verse 1, The Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary stylus, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, and I will appoint for myself trustworthy witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah, son of Jera, Jeberachiah. Had relate, I had relations with the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son, Lord said to me, name him Maher Shalal Hashbash. For before the boy knows how to cry mother or father, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria because they were invading all the lands around uh, Israel. And by the way, this is the prophet Isaiah. How interesting that his wife is called a prophetess. That means she's doing the law of God. She's a woman of God. And she's teaching other women how to do the law of God, possibly even getting words from the Lord as Isaiah did. So, Verse 5, the Lord spoke to me further because this people had rejected and gently the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoiced in resin and the son of Romalia. So these are the God. This is a reference to turning from the covenant because uh, the waters of Shiloh would have been a reference to where uh, the temple of God was in the past and rejoiced in resin Romalia. This is a, a reference to some of the gods of other nations around them from the Canaanites, and the Philistines. The Lord will surely bring against them the mighty flood waters of the Euphrates, the king of Assyria, and all his pomp. It will overflow its channels and overrun its banks. It will pour into Judah, swirling and sweeping over it, reaching up to the neck. Its spreading streams will cover your entire land, O Emmanuel. Huddle together, O peoples, and be shattered. Pay attention, all you distant lands. Prepare for battle. Be shattered. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not happen. For God is with us. So he's quoting their their plan that they're trying to state. Um, he's he's trying to say, look, these people are, even after he prophesies that the Assyrians will come in and invade them, the people refuse to believe his prophecy because they didn't follow Isaiah as a prophet because they were they were doing the ways of Baal. They were not doing the ways of Yahweh. They didn't give credit, credence, or respect to Isaiah or his prophecies. So that's why he's kind of quoting their their banter, right? Where he would say, hey, you're going to get swept over both Israel and Judah. By the kings of Assyria, and he's he's basically speaking for them in their mockery against him in return. It's kind of like this is a it's kind of like a rhetorical passage here where he's he's saying that they're going to be saying, "Oh, prepare for battle, prepare for battle, be shattered, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted." Right? I, I, unfortunately, the translator did a poor job with placing the quotations in here. There's none in, in original Hebrew. State a proposal, but it will not happen, for God is with us. So he's saying the people in that day, they were claiming, and we see this in other places in Isaiah and also Jeremiah, they were claiming, oh, God is with us. We, we worship God. But no, they weren't. They were also worshiping Baal. They thought they could be polytheistic and worship all the other gods of the surrounding nations plus Yahweh. And Yahweh was absolutely disgusted by it because the behaviors are opposite of each other. So therefore, he goes in and he tells them, you know, you're going to be taken over. And the people are like, oh, no, we'll devise a plan. We'll We'll prepare for battle. God's with us. And 
Isaiah is like, man, you're crazy. He goes on to say, I'm trying to give you the context to understand what happens here. Verse 11, for this is what the Lord has spoken to me with a strong hand, instructing me not to walk in the way of this people, because those people were worshiping Baal. Verse 12, do not call conspiracy everything these people regard as conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not live in dread. The Lord of hosts is the one you shall regard as set apart as holy. Only he should be feared and only he should be dreaded. And he will be a sanctuary. But to both houses of Israel, he's the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. To the dwellers of Jerusalem, he's like a trap and a snare. Many will stumble over these. They will fall and be broken. They will be ensnared and captured. So he's, he goes on, he's just, he just goes on and continue prophesying. But the whole point is he's, he's calling out bell worshipers who also think that they have God on their side to help them against the exact promise of the covenant that Yahweh had already told them a long time ago, which was if you stop doing my covenant behavior, your enemies are going to invade you and they will win and you're going to have problems. So this is, and Isaiah is saying, like, hey, but this is about to happen, guys. This is about to happen. So I'm not going to walk in your ways. I'm not going to behave like you. And uh, all these things that you guys think are conspiracy, and I don't even, it doesn't even enunciate everything that they thought was conspiracy in the in those days. But he's just saying that's that's yeah, that's not real conspiracy. He just told them the real conspiracy. This is the blind madness that we also see in our day as well. Isaiah just told them here the, the Assyrian Empire, which is an amalgamation of lots of different nations, is about to attack you. They're conspiring to come to you and attack you. And these people are like, no, nah, we'll be fine. We'll be prepared for battle. We got guy with us. Oh, but there's these other conspiracies we're worried about. You guys thought the CIA made up the, the idea of conspiracy? No, it's right here in Isaiah's day. Nothing new under the sun, guys. So this is, here we have in the days of Yeshua, truly against the ultimate character the entire you know the it comes to a, a finality a kind of a pinpoint if you will where these people that have been put into this place they came, by the way the Pharisees came over from Babylon bringing all these traditions with them which is a, which is just hilarious to me uh, because that's I mean that's exactly what we see with modern-day Judaism that's exactly what we see with uh, the occult. They have tons of rituals and traditions that they view as religious behavior. And Yahweh's like, that's not, that's not my ways. What are you doing? So here comes the son of Yahweh, prophesied sent Messiah, exhibiting the ways of the father, doing them perfectly. And he runs into a bunch of people from Babylon with Babylonian mindsets under the empire of Babylon. Yeah, I know it was called the Romans at the time, but it was the same. You have to... Research the history. The Romans took it over from the Greeks. The Greeks literally set up their, their headquarters in Babylon through Alexander the Great just a few, uh, 250 years before Yeshua's birth. You have to research the history there, guys. It's all Babylon. It's always been Babylon. They just go through different names, different names. This is how they trick people. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul ex exhorts, he says, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. So who are those spiritual forces and heavenly realms? Who are those? And by the way, that's not above the firmament. That's, and we're going to get into the, the exact location of the heavenly realms uh, as we as we get to the latter last three episodes of this of this investigating Babylon series I'm not actually going to express to you where Satan is and uh, according to the scriptures yes he can rally around the earth but like where's his actual home base like where where's he chilling you guys didn't think about that you guys think he goes back he goes home and goes to sleep in heaven every day and back to where the angels live above the firmament. You think he's he just goes back there and just hangs out and just lives with them. And it's like, hey guys, I'm going back to work tomorrow. I'm just gonna go down to the earth and I'm gonna go create some more problems. See you guys down there. You guys think that's how he rolls? You guys think the father is uh is gonna let him abide, even though Jude 1 6 says they left their first habitation? 
Now, yes, we see Satan go back in Job 1 and 2 and present himself before the Lord. And, and what does the Lord say? He's kind of surprised. Where'd you come from? Because it's not normal. So, yeah, keep with us. We're going to explain the heavenly realms. We're going to go into greater depth about the location of what this statement goes, what is it referring to, and actual Satan's home base. But the forces of evil are expressed to us in what we've talked about from Jubilees chapter 10 in previous episodes, specifically with the post-Nephilim and, uh, and, and part three of this series. It's the unclean spirits that were used to be inside these large giant bodies before the flood. Well, they got, their bodies got destroyed at the flood, and so now they're unclean spirits on the earth under the control of Satan as Jubilees expounds and First Enoch expounds. This is why we see them in the scriptures. Yeshua has to deal with them everywhere he goes. And as, you know, so do Peter and Paul. You know, they have to deal with unclean spirits as well. These are what the nations, even all the way back, like Yahweh in Deuteronomy 33, uh, 27, um, you have to look in the, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, but it's, you know, because there's different variances of translation, but ultimately we all understand that the idols, the idolatry, the worship of the bales and the different ash trusts and idols and all that stuff was symbolically a carving with wood, metal, or stone. But the entities that they worshipped that did manifestations through their rituals, which still happens today with, with witchcraft, those are the unclean spirits, right? Even though an idol may have been carved to a former king or Nimrod or Baal, who's Baal, or Apollyon, the, 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 the spiritual aspect of the deceptions, the familiar spirits that would inhabit those rituals and possess people and do false prophecies and all the things that happen within witchcraft and the occult, those are the forces of evil that we have to deal with, the spiritual wickedness, okay? The world's darkness, if you will. So all of them, guys, are conspiring against mankind. I want you to take that in if you can for just a second. They're, they used to have bodies. They used to walk upon the earth like normal men. They try to again if they can possess a body. And they continually did the, the ways of Babylon before the flood, or right, before Babylon was technically received that name. And they are continuing that behavior and trying to trick and perpetrate, attack, and destroy mankind, as Jubilees 10 expounds and explains. And this is the people that we're told that we, this is our main fight. This is what Paul is trying to say. This is the main fight. And there were lots of them. I'm told who knows how many. Lots and lots of these Nephilim spirits that now a tenth of them were left under the control of Mastima, or Satan character. And they're now the, the entities that we have to deal with. So all of them are conspiring against mankind. This is the Father exp expressing to you through his word. He talked about it being that quote unquote, little g gods of the nations in the past and the, 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 the demons they sacrifice their children to. Psalm 104, Deuteronomy, uh, 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 excuse me, um, Exodus 16, Exodus, uh, nope, Leviticus 17, um, Psalm 104 and a whole bunch of other places, right? Uh, that they they were called demons that they sacrificed their children to unclean spirits they're all conspiring against humanity and mass large, huge group <laughs> constantly trying to thwart us so this is the father trying to give you the proper definition of what a conspiracy is it's not someone that actually questions when they see something wrong they see something untrue or they see something that's that's a uh, some sort of red flag because it's clearly a false deception that's not the definition. That's the that's the enemy twisting that the true definition of a conspiracy for their purpose to use it as a tool to try to diminish, diminish you, marginalize you, make you look stupid. The father is telling you these are the true conspirators right here. And they're under the authority of this guy. He was, you know. According to First Enoch, he was in the mix of the other angels. Uh, apparently, he didn't get the same punishment as the other the other two hundred that took wives. But he it says that he also, like the other rebellious angels, it says that Azazel, the Satan character, the dragon, 
He also was in the mix during that time in the days of Jared and was teaching mankind all types of lawlessness. And he still has been ever since. Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was enraged at the woman and went to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So you guys notice in a pattern yet? The people that call you conspiracy people are those who hate the fact that you're covenant kids. You're covenant children of the Most High. You keep the commandments of God, the testimony of Yeshua, which is the priest, the high priest of God given for you, who does the commandments on your behalf. Not that you don't have to do the commandments, I'm talking about the priestly duties, commandments uh, pertaining to his priesthood. The whole thing here, right, is talking about the commandments of God. You are, you are a part of that through your faith and belief, your action, obviously, your discipleship. So therefore, inherently, you stepped into a situation where the forces, the spiritual world, darkness, and the forces of evil are conspiring against you. And they've got several component pieces to do that. they got this Azazel character. We're going to go over Apollyon here in a minute. They have the unclean spirits, and they have the deception of the kings of the earth that turn on their own people and on themselves and because of their deluded mindsets. The insanity that the wisdom of Solomon chapter 2 expresses about the unrighteous and how they their mind goes into insanity. They're not thinking straight at all. Revelation 9, 13, and 17, we're going to cover some big, broad things here. I'm going to expound on these ideas with greater depth in the following seven parts of this series. So please uh, be patient with me teasing some of these concepts to you right now, but we're going to expound on this with greater depth later. The King of Babylon, Revelation 9, 11. They were ruled by a king, the angel of the abyss. His name is, in Hebrew, is Abaddon, and in Greek, it is Apollyon. So, what's up with this guy? Well, Revelation 9 says he comes up out of the pit, out of the abyss, with a whole bunch of other things, and he's a king over them. So, he's a king, but why in, in Revelation 17, the other kings give their power to this king? So, it says in verse 8 and also 11 through 13, the beast that you saw, it was, this is in the days of John, about 2,000 years ago, the angel is explaining to John that the beast he saw, it was, now is no more. That means in the days of John, the king of Babylon, specifically this one that comes up out of the pit, is not, means he's not on the earth now. He's not during the days of John. He's not on the earth. So no, it's not Antiochus Epiphanes of the, third, uh, of the 300 BC, and it's not Titus of Rome or any of the subsequent emperors. Yes, they worship the beast through sun worship, but it's not literally him. So it, it says, the beast that you saw, it was, yeah, he was alive as the king of Babylon, is not now. No, he wasn't alive. He's not alive now, nor was he alive during the days of John, but is about to come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel, excuse me, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel when they see the beast that was and is not and yet will be. So this is telling you in very clear language, this dude's coming back. He's not here now. He's coming back. He was here a long time ago. It's not now. He's coming back. And the, the people of the world who are deceived will marvel at this. The beast that was and now is not is the eighth king who belongs to the other seven and is going into destruction. Yes, he does belong to the other seven because he's the eighth. He was the first and the eighth. He will be the eighth. He was the first. It says, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but will receive one hour of authority as kings along with the beast. These kings have one purpose, to yield their power and authority to the beast. So then this, so we got this, this beast character that comes up out of the abyss, out of the pit, and these kings that are given power give all their authority to him, but who but is he the final authority? Who is this this beast that came up out of the abyss? Who's he ruled by? Well, it says in Revelation 13, 7 and 8, then the beast was permitted to wage war against the saints to conquer them, and it was given authority. It was given authority. It tells you, by the way, in verse 4 and 5, the dragon gives him his authority to wage war against the saints. So he's under the authority of Satan, the dragon who wages war against those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Yeshua. You guys see the hierarchy here? Satan, King Apollyon, and the kings of the earth. 
That's the evil hierarchy there of, uh, of darkness. And then the unclean spirits are in the mix working for them as well. So this is these these are the forces of Mordor, okay. And the all-seeing eye is very appropriate because it's literally the the symbol of both Satan and the King of Babylon. So all these who's written, um, it just goes on to say that uh, the beast was permitted to wage war against the saints to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written before the foundation of the earth, of the world in the book of life belonging to the Lamb who was slain. So it goes on to expound later that not, I mean, I know it seems like it makes a blanket statement that all who live on the earth, except those whose names who have not been written in the book of life, meaning that there will be people that will not worship him. Um, and of course, those people will be martyred or persecuted. So par for the course throughout all of history, mass conspiracy, the entire world is going to be coming against to the people that refuse to worship the beast. So the father is telling you the true conspiracies that are coming. And the ones that were here in the past and all the signs of how they actually work whereas the enemy will try to tell you that the fact that you that you're noticing these behaviors suddenly you're the conspiracy theorist that you're noticing that they're literally killing children oh suddenly you're the conspiracy although they're abducting children oh you're a conspiracy theorist yet the father tells me in revelation 18 that it's the people of babylon were trafficking human souls and they will be stopped same thing that was happening in the days of Zephaniah in chapter, excuse me, and, and same thing that is prophesied in the days of Joel about the coming of the Lord in chapter 3, Joel chapter 3, where he's going to give recompense to those who sold their sons and daughters as prostitutes, human trafficking, specifically sex child trafficking. More of the practices of Babylon that are happening that Revelation addresses that these people are permitting Children of the covenant, people who keep the commandments, testimony of Yeshua, are not doing those things. So when Yeshua has to come, he has to stop the bad people from doing all these practices of Babylon. He's got to stop Babylon so he can save his children. But let's look at something real quick, guys, because as you saw, you know, on the thumbnail, we looked at, I just, you know, I referenced the idea of where this ancient Egyptian eye of Ra. Uh, and I have Horus, which also can be assimilated with Osiris. Where these ideas came from, from ancient Egypt, they're worshiping the sun god, Ra worship, Osiris worship. Same thing the Greeks did with Helios, later translated to, to the Romans with Apollos, Apollonus. This is why we see Apollo come up out of the pit in Revelation 9. We've talked about that in part 9 of this series in the King of Babylon. I go into great depth. If you haven't seen that episode, go back and check it out in the playlist. But I also had the Eye of Raw, the Eye of Horus on the, uh, or Horus, excuse me, on the uh, thumbnail, as well as the Statue of Molech, which is one of the representations of Baal. Uh, Molech and Baal are synonymous with different worship. Um, much of it had to do with child human sacrifice. That is also happening in the world today. I've done videos and had uh, uh, breakdowns on that in other videos as well. Even to the point where there's a altar to Molech in the United, Na United Nations meditation room. The what? The United Nations Meditation Room. In New York, there's a meditation room in that building where all the people come together from the different nations to make plans for what? Who are they? Whose plans are they abiding in? Plans for the covenant of Yahweh or Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon? And in that building, they have the meditation room with an altar to Molech. Babylon is everywhere. It's alive and well, guys. The uh, King Messiah, when he returns, he'll have to stop it. Because mankind can't. That's an active conspiracy happening today. The United Nations literally, you know, they're not about peace. They're about coordinating so that they can overcome the saints. I also went over that in great detail um, in a previous episode where I broke down the, um, the Lucius Trust and how they were the originating consultants for the United Nations now they were straight up occultists. Uh, one of them was a 30 sec 32nd degree Freemason, and the wife was writing eugenic stuff. And you know, she was she was a modern day witch, basically. So these people have taken off the the black robes of Babylon. They put on suits and they put on white coats to be researchers and scientists and figure out ways to create uh, harmful harmful things with pharmacia as well as enact 
with their suits on, they can act harmful laws against the children of the covenant. And this is what's this is what the father tells us all throughout the scriptures. This this fight has been going on since the rebellious watchers decided to take wives and do this stuff. Now, some people would say, hey, you know, it even goes back to the garden, right? Genesis 3, the serpent deceives Eve and Adam. They eat the apple. Yes, yes, but technically, according to the definition of a conspiracy, you don't have a group of people coming after humans to destroy them until you get to the days of Jared, to the days of the rebellious watchers. And their behavior has been perpetuated throughout all these different nations, throughout all this different time. And, I mean, it's the same concept. And the one that made it through pre-flood, post-flood, this is Zazel character, and didn't get locked away, who assumed control over these Nephilim spirits that initiated the practice of all this destructive Babylonian behavior, inspired the men who created the actual city and tower of Babylon post-flood, perpetrating the same behavior throughout history about all the different nations you guys think because they stopped doing the tower they couldn't communicate anymore that they stopped practicing this behavior when they went back home no they were already like i like i tried to share i think it was episode one of or part one of the series um they were already doing the the idolatrous worship of the watchers and the nephilim before they built the tower that was one of the things that led them to, to all come together and mass conspire to build the tower So if that wasn't enough, and then we also went over and we, we expressed this idea of ancient flying machines and how this was the vehicle of these quote-unquote gods and these rulers back in the day, and that it helped them control over the people because it was advanced tech, if you will. With that same, I have all the other practices of Babylon being infiltrated throughout all the different nations today. We have all the nations conspiring today to figure out a way to stop the children of the covenant from doing covenant behavior and they're about to, to release so to speak disclose the same type of vehicles of the gods of baal and molech and ashtaroth the nephilim the gods of ancient cultures they're about to reveal those same things in the modern day and this has to happen guys because it's i mean it's jesus is not going to be wrong when he said that when he returns, it'll be like the days of Noah. There's going to be Nephilim running around. There's going to be the the tech of ancient Babylon flying around. There's going to be the, the building projects of ancient Babylon. They're already starting them today. They've already done, you know, in smaller scale, they do them, but they're starting mega projects already. And, of course, the implemental societal practices have been ongoing this whole time, specifically pharmacia and, and uh, human trafficking. So this is where um, I had last last episode in part 12, I had a uh, West Blaze and what's it gets it Austin from what's it gets it on. And I kind of got distracted because I was trying to talk with them and interact and, and go through my information. And I, there was a lot of information I actually didn't get to cover. And I left out of last time Then I thought, well, I'll include it this week to the best of my ability. And I'm going to, but also because I do another series on West Blaze music's channel, um, I actually covered some of that information on West Blaze's channel. I'm not sure if everyone who follows this series has seen that series. So I'm going to play a clip from that because it actually expounds upon the transportation vehicles of ancient Babylon and how they're being brought back out as a form of deception. Literally, the, the governments of the world currently are conspiring about the quote-unquote disclosure of these things, and they're calling them something they're not. They're going to be calling them alien visitors from a cosmological model that were not created in. So that's the whole story is built on a lie. And it's all a form of mass deception that the world's leaders are conspiring to do in the next 20 to 30 years. And they're supposedly going to be doing it in the next year or two. So I'll just play you this quip from our last episode over at Uncommon Ground, where I expound upon how these things are actually just ancient Babylonian concepts and much of it from ancient India. I mean, for the last 70, 80 years has just been nonstop every year pushed with every form of media you can imagine. Comic books, magazines, movies, TV, everything you can imagine, guys. Literal government agencies talking about it. I mean, they've got what the uh, the government agency called SETI, 
the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I believe. That's where they have all the telescopes and everything, and they're pointing them at space, and supposedly they're just pointing them at the firmament. But like in the movie <laughs> Contact, Jodie Foster. Like, like Contact, yeah, that's right. So they have millions and millions of dollars going towards um, the propaganda that all this alien stuff is real. But guys, I'm just I want to try to share some ideas with you from history tonight that hopefully will help you understand this is nothing new under the sun. Hmm. This is actually repackaged, just like uh, we've said on this on this show and also on, on my channel. NASA, their whole theology, their whole uh, view and teachings of, of the heliocentric cosmology is repackaged from ancient India and, and specifically from uh, Vishnu and some of the multiverse and cosmic belief sets that was propagated by Vishnu and Brahma from ancient India. So another unique parallel with ancient India are these ideas of Vimanas. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Vimanas are what we're seeing in the sky when people take home video and when clips are being released by the news. In ancient Sanskrit, Vimana means measuring out and to traversing, basically a craft that goes forward, right? Mm -hmm. The Bode professor of Sanskrit at Oxford University in England in 1890 translated the word Vimana as the chariot of the gods. But we're not talking about the God of heaven and earth. No. We're talking about other gods, Nephilim gods. So it goes on to say, this is a, some of the writing of um, ancient India, specifically in the, uh, it's the Bhagavad Gata Marata, I think is what it's called, um, speaking about different types of Vimanas, what they called flying craft of the gods. The Pushpaka Vimana was a gigantic plane the size of a large city, entirely capable of holding un unlimited numbers of people, as stated by Professor D.K. Kanjalal's observations of the Matsya Purana, which is one of their Vedic texts, their religious texts. Yeah. So guys, this is telling you that they had massive, what did we see West plays in movies like Independence Day? Yeah. I mean, so many of them. A big plane that could be an entire city by itself. Hey guys, we are going to talk about that in subsequent episodes. I mentioned it briefly, and I think it was part four or five where we talked about the ancient flying machines. But I'm going to go in greater depth in this series about um, these ideas of floating cities. You'd be surprised how much historical record speaks of this kind of stuff. Um, so just a little teaser for future parts of this series. Hopefully you'll enjoy it later. So, that would fill up the entire camera angle view of the sky. You know, right. at least. So yeah, a made massive city size craft, and as right. big as this creation is, it would not. I, I wouldn't put it past the elite to have something like that hidden. That's right. And they go on to expound about what these things were, how they worked. There's an incredible amount of information in ancient Sanskrit that details who flew them, how they were used for war, how they controlled people, how they were given to the to the gods, and so right here in. It says in Sanskrit, in the Samaranganana Sutra Dahara, I don't think I said that right. You did pretty good. It's an ancient, ancient Vedic text, and it says it's written that the strong and durable must the body of the Vana be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside, one must put the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus underneath. By means of the power latent in the mercury, which sets the driving whirlwind in motion. The what? The, 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 mercury, the mercury engine sets the driving whirlwind in motion. What do we see from all these UFO sightings? That these these planes or these uh, craft that are moving through the clouds are usually spinning. I got I got a picture. Yeah. Okay. I got later. You. Yeah. And so it, it's reminiscent also of like when when Ezekiel is caught up into the heaven. It's like a a, a fake of that. Like a, a right. Type. Yeah. So he goes on to say, driving a whirlwind in motion, a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in the sky. The movements of the vimana are such that it can vertically ascend and vertically descend, and moving slanting forwards. <laughs> uh, these descriptions are incredible. Moving slanting forwards and backward, with the help of the machines, human beings can fly in the air, and heavenly beings can come down to earth. All right. Interesting. How interesting. Huh? How old uh, would you say this? Like these these ago? texts are supposed to be three to four thousand years old. Have mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Long We're before so, the modern so, invention of electricity, right? Right. We're talking Tower of Babel days, guys. Mm -hmm. So at Rama's, here's another, um, here's another quote from some of the writings. At Rama's behest, the magnificent chariot rose up to a mountain of, the cl of cloud with a tremendous din. Uh, that, that word din means like a tremendous blast of you know, power. Okay. Another passage reads, the Bhima flew with his Vimana on an enormous ray, which was, so, which was as brilliant as the sun and made a noise like the thunder of a storm. 
like a ray of light. I, it sounds like a rocket blast, right? He, yeah. Yeah. He flew fire. like it's, yeah, fire array. Mm-hmm. So these are just a few descriptions. It goes on to say in another past, according to the Dranaparva, part of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, one Vimana described was shaped like this like a sphere and it borne along at great speed on a mighty wind generated by Mercury. And that also is referred to as Quicksilver. Mercury is also known in history as Quicksilver. The wind so Wow. <laughs> right. It's telling you that it has propulsion according to this Mercury. We're going to go into that in a minute and how NASA uses it. I'm actually going to show you guys later. NASA's, when the, the actual ion propulsion Mercury engine that NASA invented in the 70s and gave to the Smithsonian. I got a picture of it. Okay. So it goes on to say, in the Laws of the Babylonians, which is uh, this particular book that was written in Mesopotamia in Sanskrit. I'm going to go over the history of that in just a minute because a lot of people are going, wait a minute. I thought the Babylonians were in Mesopotamia and the Indians were in India. How, wh- what's going on here? Just give me a minute. I'll explain. In the Laws of the Babylonians, written in Sanskrit, part of the passage of the Hakata, it and unambiguously states that the privilege of op- operating a fly machine is great. The knowledge of flight is among the most ancient of our inheritances, a gift from those upon high. We received it from them as a means of saving many lives. No Guys, way. What have we been talking about? About the false Christs that would appear. What's the world been prepping through all these movies with aliens that there's good aliens that are going to come help us to fight mm-hmm. off the bad aliens? And what is a Christ? A savior. A savior. Saving many lives. So wild. It's crazy, guys. So this Brilliant. is ancient Babylonian depictions of the manas used by Babylonian rulers in Mesopotamia. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're literally sitting in one of these saucer-shaped crafts in the sky. Hmm. So it goes on to say, a lot of people may be asking, Wes, right, but wait, Sean, how can, I thought Sanskrit was an ancient Indian language. Why are the Babylonians in Mesopotamia talking about it? Well, PhD Indian philosophy, uh, uh, Peter Sahata, uh, Peter Sahata, he actually uh, is a historian as well, and he explains that during the mid-second millennial, which is 1500 BCE, this is probably during the days of Joshua, Mm-hmm. In, Indo-Aryan tribes migrated both east into India and west into northern Mesopotamia. And through an Indo-Aryan wedge, as new waves of Indo-European migrants came down into present-day Iran, the earlier wave was wedged apart. Those who went west became sort of a ruling elite of the Hurrian people to form a powerful Mitanni kingdom. The evidence for this is seen in a treaty between the Mitanni and the Hittites. The Hittites? Well, that sounds biblical. It sure does. Sounds like the Amorites and the Hittites that lived in right next to Iran in, in Assyria. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'm being a little facetious, guys. Just the point is, all these tribes and cultures work together. The Bible is super relevant. They were, this is the people that the Israelites were dealing with that were worshiping false gods. Those false gods and their rulers had crafts that they actually flew in the sky to perpetrate deception and power over their peoples. This is why they receive worship as gods. This is yeah. why the God of the Bible was so intent on telling the Israelites, hey, don't believe all that. They're not real gods. They had deceptive signs and wonders even back then. Yeah. So it goes on to say that the Mitanni Sanskrit is considered to be a slightly more archaic form of Sanskrit than the Vedic Sanskrit. Sadly, these people seem to have got lost in subsequent history, but thankfully, those who went to India are keeping this tradition alive. So here's wow. an, Indo, an Indian, uh, Indian philosophy history, PhD, telling you that, yes, these two cultures, the Babylonians and the Indians, had intermingled all the way back to 3,500 years ago. And Mikey is back with us. What's yeah. up, Yeah. Thank you for rejoining us, brother. Thank you and for having me back, guys. Sorry about no that. No worries. And anybody who has not seen, I would highly recommend the entire series. If you go to Kingdom Cast, that's Sean's backup channel, he's got a whole series called Investigating Babylon. There was a episode of that called uh, Flying Machines, of Ancient Flying Machines, something along that effect. That is an amazing breakdown of more detailed presentation of what he was just talking about. It's yeah, I'm just cool. giving you snippets right now. We're actually getting a little bit deeper into the, the India history about this with the Vimanas. But uh, yeah, if you go check out that series, I go over the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, all those guys, because they all had the same tech. They all had this, they all shared the same theology. They just had different names for it because they spoke different languages after the <laughs> after the tower. So it's the same deception perpetrated on every nation. That's why they all worshiped a version of Baal. Here's the point. Mm. In the in the Indologist William Clarendon, so another uh, Indian researcher and uh, uh, expert yep. of ancient India, he says the, he has written down a detailed description of the Mercury vortex engine 
in his translation of the Samaranga Sutra Dahara, and he quotes this, inside the circular airframe, inside the circular airframe of this craft, where the mm -hmm. engine is, place the Mercury engine with its solar Mercury boiler at the aircraft center. By means of the power latent in the heated mercury, which sets the driving whirlwind in motion, a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in a marvelous, most in a most marvelous manner. Four strong mercury containers must be built into the vimana. The vimana develops thunder power through the mercury. Oh yeah, they're building these things right now behind our backs. Oh yeah, they have been thunder power. Yeah, this is. If they have this this much detail, like that's all they need. Like, okay, we can figure yeah. this out. Yeah, well, you guys remember that specifically Hitler took a whole group of SS to ancient Tibet and ancient India in the 30s, specifically seeking out the, the information of the Aryans, which they believe were the gods. Yeah. And this was this was how those guys traveled around. This is what we talked about in my Kingdom Cast episode about the, the Bell Project, the Nazi Bell Project. Yeah. So, this here it goes on to say. According to uh, this is going to be a tough word. I'm going to try it though. Right. According this is a, this is another uh, text from the uh, uh, the Monica Sutra. The Monica Sutra. It goes on to say, according to the Rahasya Ganahadi Hakarai <laughs> Sutra wow. number two. Very good. The pilot. It's talking about the pilot of Amanas. The pilot is one who knows the secrets. There were 32 secrets the pilot needed to learn from the competent preceptors, and only such a person was fit to be entrusted with an airplane, and no others. There are 32 secrets of the working of the Vimana. He must know the structure of the aeroplane, know the means of its takeoff and ascent to the sky, know how to drive it and know how to halt it when necessary, how to maneuver it and make it perform spectacular feats in the sky without crashing. These, those secrets are given in the Rahashya Laha. And this, I have a citation at the very bottom here. It's, it's from the, th this quote is from the Aeronautical Society of India in present day by G.R. Joyser, International Academy of Sanskrit Research from 1973. Wow. And Mikey, while you were gone, we were discussing that these concepts come from ancient India and that area from three to 4,000 years ago. They had yes. these flying wow. machines. Yes, yes, bro. So it goes on to say in that same path, I, I can't repeat the words, but in that same place I just quoted from, that same text, it goes on to say this. This is a specific maneuver one of those pilots had to know how to do. And it's called the Gudha. As explained in the Vayatatavava Prakarana, I totally messed that up. I'm sorry. If anyone's out there from India, Sounded I'm good. so sorry. It says, by harnessing the powers, the Yasa, the Vyasa, the Prayayasa, <laughs> in the eighth atmospheric layer covering the earth to attract the dark content of the solar ray and use it to hide the Vimana from the enemy. Bruh. Guys. Self technology. Guys, what are we looking at? This is the Quirky. official the official Navy photo released to the United States of the UAP, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. Blacked the out. UFO, it's blacked out. How many of these have we seen where they're blacked out? And you, you wonder, why are they blacked out? Why can't is I get it, any description of them? Why can't I see? There's no details in it, right? Yeah. It takes the dark it's, content of the solar array, like dark matter. Kind it's of it's stuff, manipulating. Or? You know how in the uh, – it's manipulating the different types of light within solar light. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's putting it could, off some kind of glow, it looks like. This is this is just one maneuver. I'm going to get to another one, oh where gosh. it makes it shine. You guys ready? Yeah. This, this is, is like the, it's like names for anime attacks. Go ahead. Yeah, literally. This is the drashia. This means to be unseen. It by collision of the electric power and the wind power in the atmosphere, a glow is created, whose reflection is to be caught in the Vishwa Kriya Drapana, or it's a mirror at the front of the Vimana, and by its manipulation. They can make that shine, that glow, as camouflage over the Vimana. Yeah, because it's it's not blacked out there; it's whited out, and that is we we see that in these, we see that all the time. Videos. Yep. All Either these horrible videos of people catching these glowing orbs going through the sky at crazy speeds of the defined left, right, up, down, defined physics supposedly. They're they're glowing. You can't get a beat on them, even with the, even with modern good cameras. They literally have their own version of self camouflage, mm -hmm. black and or glowing. This is an ancient technique from ancient vedic texts that's wild, wild. nothing wild new, nothing wrong. new under the sun guys There's nothing not. new this what this is why they don't want anyone to, to know history they, they have to teach all these watered down versions they spend how many years teaching you about the american civil war and the american revolution and yeah. the war of 1812 but how many times did you learn about ancient Indi india culture and history of the gods or four thousand year old flying machines it would completely contradict their narrative Mm, yeah. So here's some glowing orbs. Mm -hmm. 
bright white lights. Let me sorry. Here's some glowing orbs. <clears throat> this is this is not Starlink, guys. This was taken in 2013. <laughs> oh, they're gone. Oh, it's back. Nope. Oh, that one's done. <laughs> Two of them are just chilling. One's hanging out, and they're all going to start moving once they get information of some sort. Mm. Oh, it, it's going to get even crazier, guys. Stick with us if you're if you're still watching right now. Looks like we had like 140 people watching active. Well, there's more than that watching. There's 140 people in the chat. Cool. So, guys, if you like what we're talking about and this is entertaining or exciting or in, interesting to you, hit that thumbs up. So this. So it's just a little bit, a little bit there of go you know go watch that episode it's on west plays music's channel it's it's the most recent episode number eight um the alien deception is the title of the episode and i we go into even more depth about some of the unique moves those ancient vimana pilots had to know and i also show more you know modern day footage of venerating those those types of ancient writings and and what's going on there but how interesting though specifically i wanted to stop here on this moment where it's going over this glowing the mana concept um because you know as as we also talked broke down in that particular episode as well and ephesians 6 and also revelation 12 7 through 10 the idea of an, uh, the greek word agalos which is translated often as angel but it truly it's just a word messenger and it can be used of angels demons or even humans in the new testament and it is used of all three at different places how interesting we have that verse in paul where he talks about fire even an angel of light to come to you with a different gospel a messenger of light that would come to you with a different gospel so we've we know that not only satan himself because of the way their bodies are constructed being a, a made of water and spirit being of an angelic capacity he could verb you know make light protrude from himself so most people just simply think that oh it must be referring to satan but you know, you also see this idea of people being abducted by light. And then they're told a message. This is 100% modern stuff, modern testimonies that goes back to ancient occultic behaviors. So this is why the Father in Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy 13 specifically gave us a litmus test for any messages we would get. And that's what Paul's trying to play upon in his letter where he's trying to say, look, man, I mean, if someone comes to you with a different message, even an angel of light, because what is, if you don't know the message, one of the creator and his covenant, his Torah, his son, the priesthood, the resurrection, the day of the Lord, the coming of the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem. If you don't know the actual story in scripture, then you can be fooled by a messenger of light. Whether that happens with a person showing up in your room or whether it happens with a craft showing up over your house. So these... These things, guys, all this stuff is the same line, false signs and wonders that the unclean spirits and their lackeys, the kings of the earth and the people, their, their little priesthood, they get to, to do their occultic priests, priestly behavior. They've been fooling mankind with this type of stuff for, you know, all the way back to the tower. This is the religion of Babylon and their false prophets their false line signs and wonders um their false promises it's it's the ways of babylon it is uh just one more layer if you will of this ridiculously stinky onion of babylon that we're trying to peel back for you to understand not only is deception coming it's already been here but there's a much bigger deception coming that is that will if you know history and you know scripture is about to tie us directly into prophecy that is truly truly astounding to me it's one of those deals where I, you know I, my goodness it's time to pray up get right with the father learn his ways confess your sins to yeshua he's your high priest put your faith in, in adopting his ways so that you don't fall for the deceptions of babylon um, many people have asked me as, as we've gone through this series, they've asked in email and in Patreon messages and different, different things that's come from multiple people, not just one person. They're asking me, um, 
if I'm going to take these investigating Babylon episodes and, and make a one video out of it, and uh, you can do that with with the playlist. That's why I'm putting them all on a playlist as a broadcast. But um, I, I want to say yes. I, I would like to do that. I think that might be prudent, and I'm probably going to take out like. So imagine you know everything. All these part. This is part thirteen, right? So imagine all the Q and A's that we do at the end. All the the technical mess ups that I've had, all the intros and the, the commercials and things like I, if I did an actual video that compiled all these, these series, the series, I would probably take all, all that stuff. And it would probably take me a while to make it um, just because I got a lot of other stuff in my play right now. So um, just to answer everyone that's been asking. <clears throat> yeah, I think I agree with you. I think that sounds beneficial and I think that would be great. If someone wants to help me with that, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, because it would require lots of editing and it would require, you know, a lot of time right now. I just don't have. So, um, you know, maybe if we work together as a body, we can figure that out. But, um, but yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think, I mean, it could help just, you know, comp compile the info down into little segments and uh, it won't have to be 21, two hour episodes, you know, it just could be, who knows, maybe we could compile it down into like three hours if possible. So either way, we can look at that in the future when I finish the series. Um, Cause who knows? Some of you might think I'm crazy by the time we finish the series. Cause it's going to get crazier guys. Do you think flying the and um, a poly come out of the pit? You think that's crazy? It's about to get, cra it's going to get crazier. So I just, uh, everyone that that's, that sticks with me, uh, kudos to you, but I'm just trying to show what I see in the scriptures and show, you know, what we can observe in life and, and, you know, put, put, put those two together in, in a very logical, reasonable, contextual way, if I can, and see what happens. And so far, this has been what's happening, these 13 episodes.